Good morning, Professor Mohammed al Shinawi, honorable guests and attendees. I'm pleased and honored to be the first presenter in this conference today, and I wish you all a productive conference. My name is Amr Ibrahim. I'm a data and AI cloud solutions architect in Microsoft Africa, and you can connect with me through my LinkedIn profile, either with Amr Ibrahim AI or by scanning this QR code. Today's agenda, we'll talk briefly about the history of artificial intelligence, then we'll talk about what generative AI is, and then we'll talk about large language models, or LLMs for short, which are a, a crucial uh, building block in generative AI, and we'll discuss some of their capabilities and use cases. Unlike any technology and any new technology in specific, there are some benefits and there are still some concerns, we'll discuss them. And I'll, I'll end with some final thoughts from my side. Unlike most of the people think nowadays, artificial intelligence is not a very new field of, of study. There have been studies for artificial intelligence since mid-50s last century. The main idea then was to, to, to invent systems, computer systems, that can replicate or exceed human intelligence. Fast forward in time, towards the end of the century, the concept of machine learning appeared. And the idea there was to enable machines, machines here being computers or computer programs, to enable machines to learn from existing data and improve upon the data to make decisions and predictions. Then, around 2017, the concept of deep learning has been shining. It's a subset of machine learning where the machine uses layers of neural networks uh, to process data and make decisions. Last but not least, towards the end of 2021, the concept of generative AI appeared. And this requires a special look from our side. Generative AI creates new written, visual, or audible content given prompts or existing data. And this is something big because before that moment, all the AI systems were trying to depict one task, one feature of what the human brain can do. They can, the, we, we already know computer vision, where you can feed in a, a photo or feed in a video feed and ask the system, ask the AI system to count the people in the, in the, in the, in the photo, try to uh, know uh, their ages from their f facial uh, features, try to know how many males and how many females and so on. This has been in place for a long time, a considerably long time, but uh, th there has never been a possibility for the artificial intelligence systems to generate new content. This is a pivotal moment in history. So, and, and the, the keyword of prompts here is, is a very important keyword because for the generative AI systems to, to, to run and to perform, there should be some intelligence in the prompt that is being fed. The prompt is the text instruction that is being fed into the, the system to ask it to create new content whether it is written, visual, or audible, or even video. ChatGPT, I think, has played a, a crucial role of the hype of generative AI that we're facing today. Generative AI has been in place in 2021, but in November, 30th of November 2022, ChatGPT appeared, and it, it was open for registration, and it reached one, one million users in five days. And this chart in, in the screen now shows how this compares to a lot of online services. Like, for example, Facebook took 10 months to reach one million users. ChatGPT took five days, and this is a big thing. If you look at, at the time it took each platform to reach 100 million users, and this chart is uh, a bit confusing because the uh, the less numbers are, are higher in, in, the, in the BART height, you, you get the message. It took ChatGPT two months only to reach 100 million users, while for Facebook, for example, it took them 4.5 years, for WhatsApp it took them three and a half years, and so on. In my humble opinion, the main feature of ChatGPT that, that needs to be highlighted is the very important concept of democratization of AI. Democratization of AI means that AI is now accessible and usable by people who have never 
studied artificial intelligence as a science, who have never understood or even known what neural networks are, what machine learning is. But they can use artificial intelligence systems, either intentionally or sometimes actually these systems are, in, are embedded in whatever they are doing in their daily lives, to perform better, to do uh, much more with less, and so on. So the concept of democratization of AI, I think, embodies the, the, the benefit of ChatGPT. And the previous slide says a lot about that. It, it has been reachable. It, it reaches a lot of people in a, in a considerably very short time. Large language models, or LLMs, have been in, in the scope of a lot of discussions since ChatGPT appeared. And actually, they are somehow older than ChatGPT, but ChatGPT is the very famous fruit of this, at least for the common people. Before talking about large language models and foundation models, let us see how, how what we now call, ironically, legacy AI works. Normally, there is some task, for example, classification model, which is a model that can classify whether this photo is of a flower or a dog or a, a person and so on. For this model to be built using traditional or legacy AI systems, there should be some data for classification, and then the classification model is built and tested and so on, and then it is deployed to perform the specific task of classification, and so on for other tasks. For example, object detection uses another set of data and is a completely separate and different model that is called the detection model, and the result is object detection. The tracking model, where you want to track something moving in the footage of a video, you get the idea. So every single task required the, its own specific data set, and it required building its own model to do or perform that task. This entailed actually high cost and slow deployment because each service was trained and deployed disjointly. And this is where the foundation models or the large language models come into play and solve this. So large language models use data from multiple sources. The word large here is key. They use large amounts of data coming from textbooks or websites or images that contain texts or the transcriptions of speeches or even structured data in databases and data sources and so on. We use this data to train the large language model uh, and the large language model takes the data, the large amount of data, and this data is unlabeled, and this is very important, and it, it is allowed to be adapted to a wide variety of tasks. These models capture general patterns and structure of data. They aim to replace task-specific models by unifying different tasks and modalities into one. Eliminating the need to train individual models, like we saw in the previous slide, and integrate several models together, this helps us build some more autonomous systems. The key player in training large language models is what we call the transformers. The transformers are like the language experts to help AI understand and generate human-like text. They are essential in various AI applications that involve language, making technology more useful and capable of interacting with us in a way that feels natural. After the language, the large language model is trained, which takes a huge amount of training data and a huge amount of computing power, we can apply some adaptation, or sometimes we call it some fine-tuning. And with these adaptations or fine-tunings, we can tweak the large language model to do separate natural language processing tasks. And this is important. A lot of the tasks that, that the large language model does has been already available through large language models, but they were separate. There was a, a, a model for questions and answers. There was a model for sentiment analysis. There was a model for information extraction, and so on, and image cap captioning, and object recognition, and whatever. There are a lot of tasks that can be automated, and the, the key point here is that they are automated uh, only using only one model, which is the large language model here. And this actually made us think of the possibility in the near future to implement AGI instead of AI. AI is artificial intelligence. AGI is artificial general intelligence, which is basically what we're talking about here, which is 
having a machine or a computer or a system that can perform several tasks as opposed to single tasks in the legacy AI. This actually can bring us to what can the large language models or generative AI help us do. There are actually a lot of the ones that are here in, on the screen are just examples and actually sky's the limit. Text summarization is one very common task because now you have a model that can understand a huge amount of text in different languages, by the way. So since it understands the text, it can summarize without losing the context. So text summarization is one very commonly used scenario or use case for large language models. Text generation. After all, we're talking about generative AI here. So having been trained on huge amounts of data from various domains, from different languages, from different styles, and so on, this enables the predictive generative AI models to generate new text. So we can ask it to suggest a tagline for a marketing campaign. We can ask it to write product reviews. We can ask it to provide an outline for a presentation, and so on. So text generation is one important task. Sentiment analysis, again, it, it, this, these models were trained on huge amounts of, of text uh, with various languages, with various sentiments. So we can feed in some text. And, and a, a very obvious use case here is to analyze product reviews or reviews in general on online sites. So for example, if you go to an online shop where people write their reviews, people are different here. Some people would write a very short statement and others would write long statements and, and mention a lot of, I would say, irrelevant uh, input. So you can feed these with, the, with different languages into the large language models and ask them to analyze the sentiment and tell you which people are happy and which people are not. And those are happy, what are they happy about? And those are not happy, what are they unhappy about? This analysis is a very good task especially given volumes. Imagine, for example, we're working with, uh, with one of, of the teleco operators in Egypt. In their call center, they have, on average, 40,000 calls per day. 40,000 calls per day. All these calls are recorded, but they are, not all of them are heard again after recording. We're working with them now to convert these voice calls into text using artificial intelligence as well, and then feeding this text into the large language model and ask uh, or analyze and, and you can get what are people complaining mostly about, what are people requesting mostly, and you can combine this to the metadata of the caller so you, you can know which area of Egypt suffers from which whatever poor coverage, for example, and so on. So this opens a lot of potential just because you're now having a system or a model that can understand large text and do different things. Content creation, as, as we just mentioned, Another area that is being highly improved using large language models are chatbots, virtual assistants, or what we call conversational AI. Conversational AI or chatbots has been, have been in, in place for, for almost the, the previous decade, but they ha their, their intelligence was limited somehow. Now that you have this back end of a large language model that was trained on a huge amount of text and understands a lot of inputs, you can increase the, the intelligence of the chatbot and you can actually chat with your own data. This is a, a new hype that is taking place now. Chat with your own data means you'll be chatting with your documents. You provide a document like a policy document, like a product catalog, like whatever, and then you can ask the chatbot to provide you answers from this, uh, these documents. Named entity recognition is something, uh, another use case where you can provide, for example, a review on a company, and then you can recognize the product names or the place names or the celebrity names from within uh, this uh, huge text. Image annotation, which means that you can provide the model with, uh, with an image, and you can ask the model to annotate the image for you or tell you about what, the, what, what is in the image in plain language. Spell correction is another uh, beautiful uh, use case. Machine translation, since this, these models are trained on different languages, they are capable of understanding and translate from one language to another seamlessly. So you can, and actually you can combine a lot of the scenarios together. So maybe you have a large document in English 
and you want to summarize it. So this is text summarization, but you want to get the summary in French, for example. So it, it can do this. Maybe in the, in the product reviews example I mentioned, we have product reviews with different languages, but the company Egyptian is Egyptian and we need to understand the sentiment in Arabic. So it can absorb a lot of languages and uh, provide the, the output in any other language recommended. Recommendation systems is another usage. Fraud detection is a third usage. Code generation is a part that a lot of developers love actually because you can utilize the understanding of these models to generate or suggest what is your next line of code, what your next line of code should be. And this is actually a very helpful uh, use case for the developers out there. Uh, GitHub Copilot is a, a product that Microsoft and, and OpenAI have launched almost two years ago before even uh, ChatGPT comes to life. Uh, this was a, a joint um, uh, cooperation between uh, Microsoft and OpenAI. It boosted the productivity of developers in a very good way. And actually, there is limitless generation possibility with a few lines of input, and this is the key, because you provide instructions that should be that should follow some rules, but the, with few lines of input, and given the huge amount of text that, was, that, that the system was trained on, you can do a lot of uh, tasks, including the ones that are on the screen. Now we'll talk about the benefits and concerns of large language models or generative AI in general. As with any new technology, there are some benefits and there are some concerns. And, and actually, I, I'm listing here some of the benefits and some of the concerns, and the list goes on and on, but it's, it's an eye-opener to see how this uh, compares to each other. So large language models are versatile and adaptable. They can be applied in various, in various domains and tasks, as, as we mentioned, because that they, they were trained on various data. They were trained on multiple domains. They understand finance. They understand uh, engineering. They understand law and so on. So they can be used in various domains and do some uh, various tasks. Efficiency and scalability, these large language models by design are faster than traditional models and are capable of handling large data sets. The word large here is here for a reason, right? So they are by design capable of uh, uh, handling and, and, and dealing with large data sets, and they are fast and performant when it comes to execution. Again, the topic of democratization of AI is key here because they, they provide a way to make AI accessible to a broader audience. I once found a tweet on, on Twitter. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember who, who wrote that, but the gentleman said that, uh, said there that large language models or generative AI in general are transforming English into a programming language. And I would say it's transforming any natural language into a programming language because there is now a way that you instruct the computer using your own language. You don't need to be a programmer to instruct computers. And the, the software will, will utilize large language models, whatever the software is doing, will utilize large language models to do the specific tasks. And this is actually opening a new horizon in user interface and human interface with computers. On the other side, biasness of AI-generated content is a real issue and a real concern because back to the basics, these large language models are trained on a huge amount of data. What if you feed in for any topic like uh, global warming, like uh, partisan uh, points of view or whatever? What if you feed while training, you feed into the, the, the training data set only one point of view of the different points of views uh, of that topic? Then your system will, be, will, will only know about this single point of view. You can think of this in, in multiple dimensions. How about gender equality? How about ethnic equality and so on. So it is the responsibility of those who are building and training these large language models to intentionally make sure they are uh, uh, experiencing the least bias possible. Hallucination is another issue. There are some ways to, to overcome this, but hallucination means that these large language models tend to sometimes provide inaccurate information confidently. If you don't know if, whether this is a fact or not, then you'd be, you'd be convinced that this is true because of the way that, that the large language model is providing here. And this actually opens a very important topic, which is 
although these large language, language models can do a lot of tasks as we just talked in, in the previous slides, we as humans, we still need to pass this by our mind, to pass this by our experience and make sure that whatever it generates uh, comply with common sense, comply with safety, comply with correctness. So hallucination is one of the topics. Misuse of AI for malicious purposes. Unfortunately, large language models were trained on different data sets. And some of these data sets are not so good. So by design, somebody can ask the large language model for two, two comfortable ways to commit suicide, for example. Unless there are some measures in, in, the, in the system that prohibits the large language models to propose these methods, these harmful outputs back to the user, then these large language models mis might be misused. And this actually brings us to the, con the very important concept of responsible AI. Responsible AI means that companies or individuals who work on establishing or building these AI models need to do such responsibly. And a lot of big tech companies are adopting their own responsible AI principles. For example, uh, since I'm representing Microsoft here, Microsoft adopts these six principles of uh, responsible AI. Accountability means that people should be accountable for AI system. If, if something bad happens by a system that I built, I should be held accountable, not the system, right? Transparency, AI systems should be understandable. There should be no uh, ambiguity. There shouldn't be no black boxes within the systems because we need to know or trace what they are doing. Fairness, all systems should treat all people fairly. And th we can talk here about business as well. Every system, that system should uh, treat all people uh, fairly. Reliability and safety, AI systems should perform reliably and safely. If there is a contradiction between what is being done and or what is being proposed and reliability or safety, then reliability and safety take the priority. Privacy and security is a major concern here and AI systems should be secure and should respect privacy because you'll be feeding some data, some personal data or some company data to the systems. All providers should be working in a mechanism that makes sure that your private data remains private, your data remains yours and are not shared with others unless you disclose them uh, intentionally. Inclusiveness, last but not least, is artificial intelligence systems should empower everyone and engage people. And get, this gets back to a uh, concept of uh, biasness. We're approaching the end of the talk. I'd like to uh, leave you at the end with a couple of thoughts and one thought-provoking image. The first thought is now or never. We are <clears throat> at a pivotal moment of history, I would say, I, I would claim that. Uh, this is a moment of history, like the moment of uh, having access to the internet for everyone, like the moment of inventing smartphones. This is a technology that is now being democratized, that can be used by every single person on the globe to do whatever tasks they do. So. If we haven't started until now, we're already late. Ironically, this, this started, I mean, if, if we talk about ChatGPT, for example, this started on uh, November 30th last year. So it's almost um, eight months ago. Now we are eight months old. And this is a very rare moment where all the whole world is starting from the same starting point. We can be pioneers here. Uh, talking to the, to the Arabic and Egyptian friends of the audience, uh, Arabic content is poor in, on the internet. We need to, uh, this is a good opportunity for us to enrich the Arabic content, to build our own or train our own models to make sure that we have competent and performant models that can use uh, uh, Arabic data and so on. But if we're not technical, if we're not, if we are doing whatever tasks using computer, it is time to start using large language models in your daily tasks, whatever you're doing. If you are a teacher, you can ask it to help you build the lesson plan. It ca you can ask it to help you simplify some uh, uh, hard concepts to your own students and so on. And there are several ways to, to start using that. If, if you have an OpenAI subscription, you can start using ChatGPT on OpenAI. If you, have, uh, if you don't have OpenAI, you can start using Bing Chat either on your mobile phone or on Edge browser, uh, which uses on the background 
ChatGPT4, which is a very powerful model. And in all cases, you need to start learning and experiencing and building the muscle of prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is that is the term that is being called on how you instruct the large language model to do whatever you want. Th there is an art and a sci and science part of this. There are a lot of training courses online uh, for prompt engineering, but this is a skill, arguably a skill that is that will be very necessary in the very near future. It is already now very necessary. Prompt engineering is key here. On the other side, if you are a, a developer, now is the time to start building AI applications using available large language models. Uh, Python definitely is a language that uh, you, you need to, to, uh, to understand and know. Langchain, Semantic Kernel are two libraries that, that can help you streamline the development of, uh, of large language model applications. And even Flowwise AI is a no-code tool that helps you build your own applications. The very last thing here is uh, this photo from 1988 in the United States where teachers of mathematics were protesting against using calculators in elementary schools. I will not comment about this. There might be some resemblance, there might not, but I think this uh, needs to be uh, thought about. Thank you so much for your time. I, I'm, again, I'm honored to, to be with you. You can download the uh, presentation from this QR code or from this short um, uh, URL, bit.ly slash intro genai, and you can uh, uh, connect with me on my LinkedIn profile. Thank you so much.